Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. Hope you're having a great time of fellowship. Thanks for remembering it's Time Change Sunday. Happy spring forward to you. Hope everybody's wide-eyed and ready to go. I know I'm not, but that's okay. That's what time change does, right? A few announcements before we get our service started this morning. Uh, the Bible study at the Wilson's house is held in their home tonight at 6.30 p.m. So those of you who like to participate, please feel free to do so. The Stats Bible study is canceled, as well as uh, the, the ministries this week of Girls Group, Ladies Bible Study, Awana, and Youth are all postponed this week due to March break. So we hope that those families have a good time this week, get a little refreshed and refocused, especially for our leaders to finish this season out. The ministry that is continuing this week is Men's Bible Study. That is Wednesday night, so feel free to participate there. Josh and Stephanie are away visiting family today, so we welcome Lars Janssen. Yeah, we were talking about it. He, it's, you know, his heritage. But we can also call him Jansen, and he's not going to be offended. But we welcome Lars to uh, share the word this morning. He's got a wife, Sarah, and you got four kids, right? And we're glad that you took the time to come and share God's word with us today. I've got to know Lars over the time, and uh, he's a great man who loves the Lord, and I'm excited to hear what the Lord has laid on his heart to share with us today. We also got to remember Josh and Stephanie in prayer this week. As they're away, we pray for a time of refreshing, renewal, and a time of rest, that they would come back ready to go. I know they're excited to see family out there. Uh, everybody knows Zeke, uh, or at least some of us who have been around his brother Zeke, they're going out to see him. So we hope they have a great time. Let's uh, stand together. We're going to open up our service with a word of prayer. Father God, we praise you for your goodness to us. We praise you for your love and the way that it works all over the world. We know that you are living and active. And we're encouraged to know how you have led so many people uh, to reach the world and how, uh, how we can be encouraged in that and how we can be also challenged to be able to do the same thing here in Canada. God, we pray today for Josh, Stephanie, for their respite time, for their, that they would be refreshed, refocused. Pray for Lars as he proclaims the word. And we pray for those in Pocochi and Quito, that you would give them the, the continued peace, knowing that they are in your love, knowing that you're providing for them, and also the sobering reminder for us, Lord, that we would focus on you more than the things around us or the things that we have in material things. God, we pray today as we offer up this portion of song praise and this time of worship that you alone would be glorified. In the name of Jesus, we praise. Praise is rising, I start turning to you. We turn to Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you, we long for you, cause when we see you we find strength to face the day, in your presence all our fears are washed away, washed away. find strength to face the day. And in your presence all our fears are washed away, washed away.
when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away.
last song we'll sing in preparation for the message this morning is Be Thou My Vision. And I trust that your heart's desire this morning, that it be your prayer, that the Lord would be the only thing you seek in this life. So let's sing together a song of praise, but also a prayer for us this morning. Be Thou My Vision. Seated. For those we welcome Lars. Lars, come on up. Look forward to hearing what the Lord has to say. Well, good morning. Everybody awake now? Right? You taught exercise over in uh, Ecuador, and now we did our calisthenics before we start coming to God's Word. That's good. That's good stuff. So my name is Lars Jansen. I'm an associate pastor at Central Baptist Church. Some of you know me. Um, I actually grew up with Josh. I know his family quite well. He's going to visit Zeke. You know what we call Zeke in our family? We call Zeke Smart Zeke. So if any of you know Zeke, he's, he's quite intelligent. So he's Smart Zeke. So I hope they're having a lot of fun. Uh, those were some great songs. You know what struck home with me, you showed that anvil, because I'm actually a tradesman. Um, I'm a tool and die maker by trade. I transitioned into the ministry about four, five years ago now. Um, so I can see that they were welding or something hot on that anvil. It's kind of a, an interesting thing to see. Um, when your mind is focused on one thing, you tend to get pretty creative in, in, in how you use it. Like maybe you might attach an anvil to a tree stump if you have to find a way to do a job. And as Christians, our minds ought to be focused on one thing. And it's been beautiful for me here this morning to see how you as a church family, as my extended church family, my cousins in Christ, you know, my brothers and sisters here, have done things differently than the way we do things. And it's beautiful how the creativity of following God shows up in different ways in different places. It's not bound by culture. It's not bound by time or space. It's really quite wonderful. And we would say, I believe we would all say that as Christians... We're obsessed with Jesus, that our singleness of focus comes down to him, that all of history, you know, we started counting when he was born, right? All of history hinges on him. Uh, we look back to the people who were looking ahead to him, and now we're the ones who get to look back and ahead to him when he returns. 
And this is something that should define us. It ought to define us. And uh, I, I, I once heard uh, someone told me this. It wasn't meant to be a compliment. Um, we were talking, and he was getting frustrated with me, and he said, Lars, everything is about God with you. And I thought, that's an excellent compliment. I, I, I told him everything really is about God. Um, that's the way we need to be as Christians. That every single facet of our lives comes back to Jesus. That's us. Everything is about God, in a nutshell. And if you look, if you open your Bibles to Colossians 3, we're going to read it together in a minute. Uh, we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. I'll remind you again, don't worry. But if you open to Colossians 3, 1 to 4, and you scan back into chapter 2, you can kind of see at the beginning of the paragraph, the, the verse 1 in chapter 2 start, starts with, For I want you to know. Uh, verse 6 is a new paragraph. It starts with a therefore. Um, verse 16 also starts with a therefore. Verse 20 starts with if, with Christ. And the verses we're going to be looking at, chapter 3, verses 1 to, three, 1 to 4, start with if, then. All of these are contingent statements. All of these are statements pointing back to something Paul in the letter of Colossians has already told the people. He's pointing back to what it means uh, to have died and been raised with Christ. To be a part of Jesus' family. He's saying, if you're a part of Jesus' family, this. Therefore, because you're a part of Jesus' family, this. Then, because you're a part of Jesus' family, this. And here we have, if then, this is true about you. So if you're a believer here today, this passage is talking directly to you. And if you're not a believer here today, I believe you will struggle mightily to understand anything I say going forward. And so when I say, when I ask the question, have you died and been raised with Jesus? I am asking the first question that anyone needs to answer. You might say to yourself, well, no, I'm alive right here. I don't know what you're talking about. So what we're talking about when we say, when I ask, have you died and been raised with Jesus, is what I mean, what I mean is the part of you, the core part of you that we all have that is wrong, that is broken, that is anti-God, we call it our sin nature, has that part of you come to Jesus? Have you said, Jesus, I am wrong, I am broken, I need you, I need your help? Because what God's word says then is if you ask Jesus for that help, well, when Jesus died on the cross, what happened is that sin nature, that brokenness, that evil that you would be accountable to pay for was nailed to the cross with him. And when Jesus died, you died. And then when Jesus rose, you wrote. So when I ask, have you died and been raised with Jesus? What I'm asking is, has there been a time in your life? Sometimes it's a, it's a pinpoint moment. You can point to the place on the, on the floor you were sitting or, or the, the time on the clock. Sometimes it's a season of life in which you, you realize you have understood this reality and you've come to Jesus. What I'm asking is, have you asked Jesus for the help that only he can give? And in asking for the help that only he can give, have you died with him and then been raised with him? Because only he can do that. And the beautiful part of that is if that's true about you, if that's not true about you, now is a great time. Talk to Jesus in prayer right now and ask him that. But if it is true about you, the moment you asked for that, the moment you were raised with Jesus, that's when your eternal life with God began. Your physical body may die if Jesus doesn't come back before you die. But you will never experience the suffering he experienced on the cross. You will never know the wrath of God for your sin because you have died with him and he took that. And you are raised with him and right now you know that. So that is the fundamental first question. Have you died and been raised with Jesus? Because if, if you have 
then you can understand what I'm saying next. Then you can understand about Jesus being the most important thing. Because our world is obsessed with a lot of different things. We are excessively preoccupied with a lot of different things. You know, you can list them in, in packages. There's, there's entertainment and pleasure. Think for a moment of the industries, of the, the monetary value of those enterprises pursuing entertainment and pleasure. Huge obsession in our culture. You could think of comfort and happiness. You know, what, what do we do with our homes? How do we spend our time? What are we pursuing you know, after work and in work? The huge obsession of our culture. You could think of fulfillment and meaning. We look everywhere for a purpose, for a cause. People wave signs. People blow things up. People commit atrocities in the name of finding meaning, of fulfilling purpose. Our society is obsessed with these things. We chase after them. But as Christians, we have come to know that whatever obsession society has, the only healthy obsession is Jesus. He is the only healthy obsession. That's what we're going to see in this passage of Scripture. I'm going to pray now to ask God to help us as we, as we start reading through his word here. Please bow with me. Father, we have raised your name high in song already this morning. You are amazing. We all belong to you. The unexpected thing for many is, even if they deny you or disagree with you, they don't realize that ultimately they belong to you too. And you will claim them. If they do not ask to be a part of your family, Lord, they are under your wrath. Lord, we are so grateful, those of us who are part of your family, that we have no fear of you for wrath. We have a delighted fear of you for joy. Jesus, we thank you for how you have revealed your Father to us, how you have shown us God of God. And in this passage, we will see who we are in you. And be reminded of the hope we have when all of our life aims at you. Holy Spirit, we cannot do this alone. We are broken and frail humans. Our minds are easily distracted, our trains of thought interrupted. Holy Spirit, I know you're here. You are in every one of your believers. And only you can do the work that it needs to be done now. So I pray for all of us that you would open our hearts. You would show us a captivating view of you. You would eclipse all else with your wonder that we forget even ourselves. Lord, lift yourself high through your word this morning. Pray this for your glory, and we pray it also for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 starts like this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The if statement. If then you have been raised with Christ. Point is, believers, you have been raised with Christ. He says, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In the second verse, he says, set your minds on things that are above. But what he's telling us to do here is acknowledge reality. He's saying, having been raised with Christ, our minds are on Christ. So we, having been raised with Christ, our minds are now consumed by Him. That seems simple, right? Any nods? Seem okay? Yeah? Congregational interaction is welcome. Okay, let's just walk through these two verses for a minute. They're going to come up on the screen here. They're already up. Thanks, guys. 
So if you look at this, it says, if then you have been raised with Christ, I underlined Christ there. I've laid this out in a way so you can see some of the connections. Okay? So if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Why would we seek the things that are above? Because that's where Christ is. And where, what's he doing up there? Well, he's seated at the right hand of God. So we're seeking Christ who is above because we've been raised with him. So set your minds on things that are above. Well, we know why, because Christ is there. He's above at the right hand of God, not on things that are on the earth. So what he's saying is that the, the thing that captures our mind's attention, the thing that holds our mind's focus, the thing that consumes all that we think about is Christ. Thank you. Our mind is on Christ. So that means everything we think about, everything we consider, everything that goes in or out, goes through Christ. Is touched by thoughts of Christ. How does that work? Has anyone ever tried to like control what you're thinking about? Yeah, have you ever ever sat still and thought, I'm going to think only about this one thing? Anyone got a record? Like, what's the longest you can do that for? Yeah. (laughs) Until you like feel itchy somewhere. (laughs) Or you hear a noise. Or you remember groceries you need to buy. We're so easily distracted, right? So what does it mean? What does set your mind on things above mean? How do we do that? How does that work? You know, the, does anyone know there's a clip, an eclipse coming? I think, is it April 8th? Is that the day? Yeah, and they moved, a, a, my kids got this too. They moved the, the PA day to April 8th so no one goes blind or something. Our, the Brantford Library is handing out those glasses so you can look at it. Um, so anyway, what's an eclipse? Anyone? A solar eclipse, I should be. What happens? Yeah, the moon comes between the earth and the sun. I I got a question for you. If you were on Mars, would you see the solar eclipse on May 8th? No. If you were on the moon, would you see the solar eclipse on May 8th? Where do you have to be to see the solar eclipse on May 8th? On Earth. Your perspective matters. Where you are matters. You see things from where you are. Uh, You ladies in the back, you can't see the guys in the front in the or in the front, as, as, as well as I can, because I'm standing up here. You know, none of you can see this screen, because I'm standing right here. The people at the back, they can see everyone in front of them, but the people at the front can't see them. Where you're sitting matters. You know, if Jay wanted to see anyone, he'd have to, like, screen all around to see everyone, because he's way over here. Where you're sitting matters. Your perspective matters. And what this passage is saying You've been raised with Christ. So you are looking at everything through Christ. It's saying the way you see the world, the way you see everything, is redefined by Jesus. Just like we wouldn't be able to see the solar eclipse unless we were on earth on April 8th. Where we are standing allows us to see everything differently because of Jesus. But when it says, set your mind on things that are above, what it's saying is that Jesus is our lens for life. Everything we look at, everything we perceive, world events, everything, personal suffering, everything, goes through the Jesus lens. And this is not a muscle we flex. This is not something we try really hard to do. This is an acknowledgement of reality. Any perspective for a Christian, any perspective without Jesus is inconsistent with who you are. It's believing a lie. It's actually dangerous. Maybe like looking through an eclipse without the glasses. It's dangerous to see the world without Jesus when you belong to Jesus. When having been raised, our minds are set on him. Because Jesus is our only healthy obsession. 
Let me ask you a few questions. You don't have to answer these out loud, I guess, unless you really want to. But these are good questions to think about. That help us think, what does it look like to have our minds on Christ? So think about this. Is Jesus the reason behind my interest in sports and stories? I group those two because I don't care at all about sports. But I recognize that sports are stories. You watch a sports team play because you want to see how it goes. You want to see who does what. You want to see the plot points in that game. Just very much like a person like me who would rather read a book or watch a movie enjoys the plot, enjoys the story. So if you enjoy stories, if you enjoy sports, is Jesus the reason behind that? Because he should redefine our thinking about earthly interests. The stuff we care about here, we should care about through Jesus. Have you ever heard it said that history is his story? Heard that? Kind of catch it. History is his story. So any story, anything that you're interested in here, does it come through the Jesus filter? You know, when someone gets injured in a game, what's your first reaction? Yeah, now my team's going to win, or I'm praying for that guy on the field because I know someone who can heal him. I know someone who can take care of his family. When it goes sideways in the movie you're watching, <laughs> there's actually something very funny that happened to me and a friend of mine. Uh, we were young adults, and we were reading a comic book that was just ridiculous, and the character in it was making all kinds of bad decisions, and we were talking about the good decisions he should make, and my friend looked at me and said, I think this guy just needs Jesus. I was like, yeah, that's true. He's a total fictional character, but that's exactly what he needs. He needs Jesus. Is that the kind of thinking that enters into our mind? Let me give you another question. This is a bit of a trick question. Don't worry, I'll take the trick out of it quickly. Is Jesus the originator of my possessions and relationships? First of all, that's a yes or no question. We realize that's a yes answer, right? He's where all of those things came from. He's where our possessions come from. He's where our relationships come from. So really, knowing the answer to this question is yes, what then? What then? Since Jesus is the originator of my possessions, of my relationships, what does it mean to set my mind on things above in my relationship? Do I settle my value in this person or in Jesus? Do I settle my value in this thing I own or want to attain or in Jesus? You know the easiest way to evaluate that? Imagine that person or that thing taken away. What would happen? Would you fall apart? I mean, there's nothing wrong with grief and mourning. That's a real thing and it should happen. But is your three-legged stool the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Or is your three-legged stool the Father, Son, and something else? I'm just going to fall down when that something else comes up. Especially when you're young. That's worth thinking about. When you're starting to form those relationships, decide how you relate to your possessions. Are you going to let them rule you, or are you going to see them through the lens of who Christ is? When we're older, even when you're older than me, you need to hear that too. What's the most important thing? Jesus should define our relationships. We shouldn't add him on at the end. That's a denial of reality. One more question. Listen to this. And this one, be gentle with me. I read a sign on the way here that made me think someone might not be gentle with me about this. Is Jesus the center of my political ideology? We can have strong political opinions. 
and believe that this is the right way, this is the wrong way, this is the left way, this is the right way, whatever it is. We can think that this person should be prime minister, this person should be president or premier or whatever, or they shouldn't. We can have strong opinions about that. But who is king? Who is king of kings? Who rules the rulers? Who put them there? If God put them there, if God rules the rulers, will I look at politics through the Jesus lens? Knowing that my salvation doesn't come from a prime minister or a president or a premier or a mayor or any earthly authority, but by the grace of God, I can submit to Jesus and therefore to them. That's a hard pill to swallow when we see things going wrong, when we see corruption in the world. But we know the king. We follow the king. My political ideologies, the thing I believe about how things should be run, even organized in the church, even organized in my family, those come through the Jesus lens. You see how it's a bit obsessive? We really need to obsessively involve Jesus in our worldview because we have been raised with Christ. Because we are setting our minds on things above as an acknowledgement of reality and who we are in Christ. And we should be obsessive about that. Look at the next two verses. Look at verses 3 and 4 here with me. It starts with a 4 again. Because you are believers. Because you trust Jesus. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now that is a weird sentence. Agreed? You're dead. And your life. Well, I, You just told me I was dead. Paul, what's up? So you have died, and your life is hidden in Christ, with, in, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, that makes it a little more color on it. That, that leads back to the having died, being raised. You having been raised, right? Oh, our life was with Christ. So we did die. We are raised. So your life, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now look at, look at this here. Can you pull up the underlines again, guys? You have died and life. You see the, the eye in the way? Can you all see more or less? Get small. For you have died and your life. There's that contrast right there. Your life is hidden with Christ. Again, we see Christ emphasized again with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So you died, but you have life. It's with Christ. When he comes back, you'll know exactly what that looks like. See what this is saying? It's saying your life is Christ. The, the verse above, the verses above, were telling us that having been raised... Our minds are on Christ. This one is telling us that having died, we are only alive in Christ. Without him, we would be totally dead. Without him, we wouldn't be able to do anything. We would be like dead people. Yeah, in sin, we would be unable to please God, unable to know God, unable to walk in the way that he wants us to walk. What he's saying is having died, we are only alive with Christ. See, this is this is a little a little different. I use the analogy of, of seeing the uh, solar eclipse from Earth. You can't see it from anywhere else. It matters from our perspective, but we see the Earth from the Earth's perspective too, because right now we're we're on a spot on the planet. You know, it's spinning around in space around the sun, but we are seeing the Earth from the perspective of one who dwells on the Earth. We see ourselves and our surroundings 
from our own perspective. But when I look down at myself, I see myself a little differently than you see me from your perspective. And what this passage is saying, you have died. And who you are, your life, who, exactly who you are, is bound up in Christ. And you will only see who you are through Christ. So who we are is different than who we were. We died. Who we were is gone. Who we are is in Christ. So when I look at myself, when I consider myself, when I am kind of self-aware, it's a lot like when I look around maybe at my property or my house. I'm looking at it from the perspective of that place. So when I look at myself, I need to see myself the way Jesus sees me, the way God sees me. So, I mean, I know. I look in my heart and I see all the brokenness. I see all the wrong. I see the things I, I do that I don't want to do. But when I remember that I've died and that my life is hidden with Christ and God, I know that he sees me differently than all that. When God sees me, he sees Jesus. And so when I see me, I can kind of forget about me a bit and just see Jesus. And there's this beautiful reality where we can look at the world around us differently because of Jesus, and we can look at ourselves differently because of Jesus. We ourselves are redefined with Jesus. You've heard the term, we're made new. But we're looking forward to when that's fully done, when Jesus comes back. But even now, we are different than we were before him. He is our life. And again, let me tell you that trying to live life without him is dangerously incompatible with reality. You try and live life without Jesus, and it's like cutting off your legs or your limbs and, and just trying to move forward in life the way you always have. It, you can't. You can't think. You can't see. You can't process. I mean, I think, I think we've all, whoever's had young kids has experienced this, like that fog. Or whoever has had like a significant loss of a loved one in their life has experienced that fog. Or, or a huge illness where everything kind of is, is pulled together and focused and, and all we can really think about is doing the next thing. Because what is happening, what is happening to us is consuming everything around us. Well, that's what needs to happen to us with Jesus. Only instead of the fog and the, the oppression and the pressure, when Jesus is the consuming reality of our life, when we realize that that's true, there's freedom. There is the ability to let other people do things that you don't have to do. There is the ability to step back and realize, I am not anyone's savior, but I know the savior, and I can point people to him. There is the ability to realize that God has not called me to save anyone at all. God has not called me to solve all of your problems. He has called me to point you to the person who can. And he's called you to the same thing. The relief of that focus, of that realization, of that, that self-awareness of who we are and what we're doing because of Jesus is beautiful. It's, it's lightning. It's like Red Bull. It gives you wings. Better than Red Bull. But let me ask you a few questions about this. And these should get at the heart of this idea that we have died and the only reason we're alive is because of Christ. And that we can look at ourselves differently because of that. And we need to look at ourselves differently because of that. Question one, number one. Is Jesus my greatest passion? Now that may sound vague to you. How many of you have had a great passion in your life? Or have? Anyone gotten married? Hands up if you're married or have been married in your life. Okay, so I hope you have had a great passion in your life at least at one point. You can remember leading up to when you were going to get married. You can remember the, 
how that consumed your thoughts, how that, that, that made you <laughs> want to focus your life, plan this event, and you were excited to get married. Great passion. There's all kinds of things like that. There's all kinds of things get, that consume us, and it's not wrong. What, what's wrong is when Jesus doesn't consume us more. So the goal here isn't, you know, is Jesus my only passion? Because that's not how God made us. He gave us many passions. And I suppose if we went around the room, we would probably find a startling variety of things that people were passionate about. You know, different hobbies, different causes, different people, uh, different places. And that's good. If, if what? Yeah, if Jesus is the greater passion. If Jesus eclipses, got an eclipse coming up, that passion. Think about this. Is being with Jesus the goal of how I use my body? You know we were designed to have a body, right? Our bodies are not bad. Adam and Eve had bodies. Jesus was resurrected in a real body, and we will one day have bodies. That's what this passage is talking about partially. Um, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. We'll be like him. We'll have bodies. But what you do with your body now matters. So what's the goal of what you do with your body now? serve God. That's beautiful. That's a good way to say it. And there are so many ways to do that. You can serve God by smiling at people. You can serve God by giving money to things. You can serve God by bringing people food. You can serve God by letting someone cry on your shoulder. You can serve God in your closet at home on your knees in prayer. You can serve God sitting still without any, any motor skills remaining in your body. It's a Godward attitude. It's recognizing that this next thing I do, this thing I'm going to, I'm doing that because of and for. And every passion in your life, under that umbrella of a passion for Jesus, makes it holy. You know, we have this kind of disjointed view that um, pastors are the ones doing the real ministry, or missionaries are the ones doing the real ministry, um, and the rest of us are all just kind of along for the ride. That's, that's not good. That's not healthy. When you go to work, and you work on that anvil, you nail to a, a tree stump. When you do whatever you're going to do, you use your body for Jesus. And that's glorifying to God. That's showing people what God is like. Jesus was a carpenter. Do you think he did that for God's glory? Yeah. Listen to this, this other question. Is Jesus the source of my expectations and dreams? Because the source is very often what I want. But when what I want comes under my passion for Jesus, this can, this can take a prayer to ask Jesus to change our desires. When that happens, all of a sudden what I want is what Jesus wants because I humble myself under what Jesus wants. And then my expectations, my dreams, the things I'm going for, the things I want to do, I see them through the Jesus lens. Have we ever really taken time to think about it? Right now. Jesus is alive. Right now, Jesus has a body that we can't quite comprehend what it does and how it does it. And the fact that Jesus is alive, the fact that he can hear us talk to him right now, means that one day we will be alive like he's alive. We will have a body like he has. That expectation, that hope, 
can color all other hopes, all other expectations. We can live knowing we're only seeing a part of it now, and someday we're going to see the whole picture. And even sometimes the part we see now is amazing. How much more amazing when we get to see the whole picture. When we get to be like him, with him. Do you see how it's obsessive? Do you see how you could pick up any, any thread in your life, any item in your house? And we ought to learn to make that about Jesus because it really is. And if we don't see how it is, this passage is telling us, Let's start saying, because this is true about you, set your minds on these things. Because this is true about you, think of yourselves this way. It's not saying, make this true about you by doing these things. Twist your mind to believe this is true about you by doing these things. It's saying you are already this. Learn to acknowledge that in reality. That's hard. Anyone an expert on that in the room? Neither. Really easy to lose focus on this. Really easy and not be obsessed with Jesus. And to let other things creep in. This is what it means, set your mind on things that are above. If you have died and been raised, Jesus, then this is already true about you. What Paul, the Holy Spirit here, are encouraging us to do is acknowledge that reality. To ask ourselves, are we excessively preoccupied? Are we obsessed with Jesus? Or is he... Secondary issue that gets tacked on sometimes. Is to ask ourselves, do we obsessively involve him in our worldview and self-awareness? Will someone come up to you very irritated and say, everything is about God with you? You'll say, thank you. These are good questions to ask, but here's how I want us to think about it. What if there was an investigative journal? Someone who would follow you around for a day or a week or a month, would take notes and ask you questions, who would see the way you lived. Would that investigative journalist come to the conclusion that you have died and been raised with Jesus? Because you're obsessed with him. What would the evidence show? This is not a guilt trip. This is not me saying, you you may be doing it badly, start doing it right. This is an opportunity of grace for me and for everyone here. Because as we, as we lose track, as we walk down the wrong ways of thinking, as we look at ourselves as if we, as if we have to earn God's favor, and not as if Jesus has already made us beloved sons and daughters, we deny the truth. And have the opportunity, every time someone reminds us, to repent, ask for God's help, and live in light of the truth. It's a moment of grace. Evaluating this way, thinking this way is a moment of grace. Because really, Jesus, if you you think about it in these terms, he is the only truly healthy human. Ever thought about it that way? And we talk about mental health and we talk about physical health and different things like that. And we've all got a little something going on, don't we? We do. Please don't leave me alone. I know I do. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus is the only truly healthy human. And he died so that we could have what he had. And if we are raised with him, have died with him and been raised with him. We have it. 
No, we're not going to act perfectly all the time. But in, in the eyes of God, in the eyes of us, in the way we live in this world, we are already like Jesus. And in reality, we're becoming more like Jesus every day. Being obsessed with anything but Jesus, but this perfect human being, this fully healthy human being, is, is far more than inconsistent as a Christian. It's dangerous and it's hypocritical, denying reality. But my friends, now you know. Didn't know already being obsessed with Jesus is extremely healthy. He is the only Father, I thank you so much that you love us. Jesus, I thank you so much that you have paid for us. As we mature and grow, Jesus, fill our vision with yourself. We ask that you would make yourself our healthy obsession. That we would set our minds, learn to set our minds on things that are above because of you. Lord, consume us. Inform us right up to that day when you will appear in your glory and we will be like you. Lord, we pray all of this because you are good, because you are exactly who you say you are. I invite you, I invite you to stand as we sing in closing, How Great Thou Art. Sings my soul.